This is the voice of the report of the week. Signing on. Well, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in. Welcome one and all to this newest edition of VORW International, the podcast, presumably the late December 2022 edition. Probably right after Christmas, if I had to take a guess. Hope everyone out there tuning in is feeling and doing all right. And I hope you had, of course, if you celebrate Christmas, hope you had a very pleasant one. No matter what, hope you had a nice holiday season. So this program, I I don't really know what to call it. I suppose I could really say that about any show that I do. It just, it is what it is. It's kind of purposeless if I had to, if I had to uh, give my opinion on it. I just get to the microphone and babble for about an hour or two or three or more. But people listen <laughs> for reasons I, I will never understand. So here I am once again at the microphone. But I, I suppose you could call this an update show, at least to an extent, because there are certain updates that I'd like to give. And admittedly, it was my intention to have this show uh, sent out a little bit earlier than it actually was. For that, I apologize, but there's good reason why I don't have this show on an explicit schedule, because things like this uh, do happen. But anyway, so some of these updates may not be the most punctual in the world, but they're things that I wanted to talk about nonetheless things I wanted to uh, to bring up. Now, the way I do this show, and I've talked about this before, I, I record it in segments. And I recorded a segment, let's say, two weeks ago, and then I recorded another segment uh, a week ago, etc. So it's kind of been put together in a, a piecemeal sort of fashion over the course of the month of December. So, if any of the editing seems a bit crude, you know why. But at the very least, with that understanding, I hope it still comes across in a uh, digestible and acceptable format. And I hope that the information I wish to convey is delivered, at least in a concise enough manner. For those of you watching this program on YouTube, I have two pieces of fan art. The first piece of fan art, to give credit where credit is due, shout out to a listener who goes by the name Vero Factum. That's V E R O space F A C T U M. And I don't believe any specific social media platform was provided. At least I don't have something written down. And I would imagine you could just search up that name on some various profiles on social media. It looks like there is a website. I think it's just verofactum.com. I'll give a little bit of a story for the heck of it about that piece of fan art, because that's uh, some people have made a meme out of this, and uh, it's one of the better-known moments from the channel, at least, where I'm sitting there eating the burger, and I have the shortwave radio next to me, and uh, I I turn the radio on, and just this look of despair comes across my face, And sometimes you'll have folks out there who will uh, go ahead and uh, 
they'll overdub the audio and make it sound like there's something on the radio. The, the whole story behind that, that video was uh, something I did back in 2017. I was doing a review. And one thing that I did back then, I don't do it as much these days, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll bring it back at some point to try to make the eating segment a little more tolerable, perhaps. I would sometimes have the shortwave radio with me, and I would uh, have a various station on while I'm eating. And at that point, I was doing the review in the early afternoon, and the frequency that I was tuned to was 17, 530 kilohertz. And that frequency at the time was used by the Voice of America. And I knew that during the midday hour, based on where the broadcast was transmitted from, it was beamed toward Africa, but inadvertently, just the way it was angled up, it would get a very good signal to the United States as well. So, knowing that, my goal was to turn the radio on and have the VOA in English on while I ate. But I got the time wrong, because I think I was... I think I was an hour late. And in my mind, I thought, oh, it starts... You know, just to give an example. Oh, I thought the broadcast started at 2 p.m. In reality it would start at 1 p.m., so I missed it. So there I was, confidently thinking, all right, we're going to have the VOA to listen to. I turn it on, and it's, it's not there, because, again, I got the time wrong. That was my mistake. So uh, my, uh, my reaction, it was a bit of genuine surprise, and then I kind of had some fun with it, but I, I was taken off guard by that. I, I, I was, but that's the story of that. It wasn't that I intended it to be static, I just thought a station was going to be there that, that wasn't. Anyway, the second piece of fan art going out to Dawn Reynolds in Tennessee. So shout out to Dawn. Again, checking in from Tennessee. Two pieces of fan art there for the broadcast. If you are feeling artistically inclined and you'd like to submit a piece of fan art for the next program, could be anything, have fun with it, exercise your creativity, and it'll be my pleasure to share it. So if there is a piece of fan art you'd like to uh, share, I'll be happy to feature it in the next program that I do. I'll credit you in the description. Please just let me know how you'd like to be credited, be that by name, a website where more of your work can be found, a social media profile, etc. If no name or no uh, distinct preference for how you'd like to be credited is given, then I will keep you by default anonymous. Way to submit fan art, very simple. Just send me an email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com and include the fan art as an email attachment. Or you can upload the image to a third-party image hosting site and then send me the link via email. But please also let me know how you'd like to be credited but really, it's as easy as that. Before we continue with the show, I'd just like to uh, take a brief break, just to go into a message from the sponsor, who helps keep this broadcast going. Tired of poor quality fashions that have to be thrown out after just one season? Ecocentric has the high-quality, trendy styles you're looking for. Shop their hand-picked vintage clothing and upcycled fashion accessories. Browse the wide selection of vintage and pre-loved clothing that is much better than stores. Love the way you look and feel. It's the eco-friendly choice that makes our world a better place. All eco-centric items are pre-washed and ready to wear as soon as your package arrives. Easy online shopping and fast shipping with great customer service. Visit eco-centric 
and save 15% off your choice of items for a limited time only, use the following coupon code at checkout, ECOCENTRIC15, that's E-C-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-K-15, at checkout. Remember, that's ecocentric.etsy.com, E-C-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-K dot Etsy, E-T-S-Y dot com, that's ecocentric, with a K, dot Etsy dot com. If you want to support this broadcast, you could always do so with a donation via PayPal to V-O-R-W, I-N-F-O at gmail.com. If you like the content and you want to hear more of it, consider supporting it that way. Or you can support it via Patreon, patreon.com slash the report of the week. All right, a few other things that I want to get to before I get into the uh, material that I, I essentially already recorded, because like I said, this is kind of a piecemeal sort of show. I didn't mean for it to be, but it's it's just the way it wound up. But anyway, a few things I want to get to uh, likewise. All right, we're getting near the end of 2022, and obviously in just a few days, 2023 will begin. And if you are a regular listener to this program, or at least if you've listened to past programs, then you know that one thing that I do each year, for the heck of it, I mean, it's just fun to do, and then it can be fun to revisit a year later and see uh, if anyone was right or wrong, is the predictions show that I do. My goal for January 2023 is to do two shows for January. One will be the prediction show, where it's just going to be dedicated entirely to listener predictions for the year. And the second show will just be a normal one where I talk about whatever and uh, read other emails, general questions, feedback, etc. So being that I intend to do the predictions show within the next week, week and a half, I am going to give an open call for any listener predictions. So here's how it works. The next show that I do, again, is going to be the listener predictions show for uh, 2023. Here's how it is. I open up the email, and I will just spend the show reading your predictions for 2023. And it's as easy as that. So all you have to do is send me an email with what you think is going to happen in 2023. Now, the predictions can be specific, or they could be generalized, and it could be anything. It can cover world news, current events, national news. It could cover politics, could cover celebrities, could cover the arts, literature, science, health, anything. could be a personal prediction for you. It could be a very... Uh, light-hearted, fun prediction. It could be a very deep, possibly dark prediction. Positive, negative. It's an open slate. What do you think 2023 will have in store? You can keep your predictions as long or as short as you'd like, but just send them to me in writing to V-O-R-W... I-N-F-O at gmail.com. That's V-O-R-W. I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Of course, please note when sending these predictions, of course, I reserve the right to whether or not the predictions will make the final cut and be on the air. Uh, But of course, if you don't toss your hat in the ring, then there's no chance at all. So if you want to make a prediction, best bet is to send it in. Personally, I try to read as much as I possibly can. And likewise, I try not to cherry pick 
nor do I try to censor the predictions that come in. Sometimes in abiding with the guidelines on YouTube, I'll sometimes have some predictions that only go out on the other sites and get edited out uh, for YouTube so the show doesn't get shut down. Uh, But in this broadcast, it is just my tradition to respect other viewpoints and try to let folks have their say. I never like the concept of being in an echo chamber where all you hear is stuff that you agree with continually and that only gets bolstered up and bolstered up and it's nice to sometimes get exposed to different ideas even if you disagree with them it could be entertainment sometimes it can make you think could provide perspective you never know and it goes all ways people always like to assume there's a slant when you say this sort of stuff i don't think so i think it could be very good for critical thinking likewise but it's something that i stand by And I'll tell you what, over this year, that has cost me a few listeners. I've gotten some very, very aggressive, nasty emails over the last year because of that. But this is just, this is what I believe. I stand by it. That doesn't mean try to be edgy or offensive, but like, for instance, let's say if you're making a U.S prediction, and let's say it's obviously right or left-leaning, just don't worry, don't feel like, oh, I don't, you know, just send it, I, I, I don't care, this just doesn't, that doesn't bother me, and uh, like I said, look, even if something is a little out there, just try to be polite, be respectful, and uh, throw your head into the ring if you'd like, but again, the way to send in a prediction, V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O, at gmail.com. And again, try to, uh, I'm going to try to get the show done within the next week, week and a half. One thing that I always mention, and this is another reason why I just say, if you want to send a prediction, please send it. I've been doing the prediction shows for years now. I think I did one for at least 2019. I might have done one for 2018 also, but I know I definitely did one for 2019, 20, 21, 22, and uh, this will be the fifth or sixth one that I, I've done. But you mentioned that I did one for 2020, and obviously you know what a crazy year 2020 wound up being. And you know the year started off seeming like it was just going to be a continuation of 2019, which was which was pretty crazy in and of itself. But then, obviously, uh, come mid-January and then into February 2020, it just went up to a whole, a whole nother level. So you might think, wow, you did a prediction show for 2020. I wonder, wouldn't that be entertaining to listen to, right? To see what the folks thought that uh, 2020 was going to be. Well... Here's the thing. I set everything up to do the prediction show. I tried to give the call for predictions. And almost no one sent a single prediction. I think everyone just assumed that someone else was going to do it. So no one did. And I think what would usually be a show several hours long was only about 15 minutes long. There really wasn't anything. And, uh... It was just a missed opportunity, but it is what it is. But I always use that as an example just to say, hey, if you're feeling like sending one, then send it. Give it a shot. And like I said, it's purely up to you what direction. doesn't mean that it has to be some sort of hardcore geopolitical prediction. It could be something funny, lighthearted, humorous. could be about social media or entertainment or, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to predict, anything about 2023, just go for it. It's a blank slate, no guidelines. So I just want to throw that out there. I wanted to open up the news real quick. I wanted to look at two things. That cold weather that has swept across much of the country... Hope everyone out there was staying warm. 
because unfortunately, there were a number of deaths. The prolonged winter storm that brought heavy snow, high winds, and brutal cold to most of the U.S. this past week has killed at least 37 people and has hundreds of thousands without power. Perhaps the worst impact was around Buffalo, New York, where 43 inches of snow fell as of Sunday morning. Roads were impassable. Power substations were frozen. More than a dozen people died, Erie County officials said. Over the past week, the winter storm brought dangerously cold temperatures, blizzard conditions, and coastal flooding to almost the entirety of the U.S., wrecking Christmas plans along the way. More than 55 million people were put under wind chill alerts, and freeze warnings are in effect across the South. The blizzard conditions persisted over the holiday weekend across the Great Lakes, while frigid temperatures gripped the eastern two-thirds of the country. New York City saw record cold temperatures on Christmas Eve at several locations. The high at Central Park was 15 degrees, marking it the second coldest December 24th in at least 150 years. So isn't that something? And uh, again, I just wanted to point out, there were 37 deaths because of the cold weather. Isn't that something? People just say it's the cold weather, but, you know, yeah, we, we have winter, and of course it gets cold every year, but the fact that 37 folks, I'd have to imagine probably most, if not all of them, thought they'd be making it to, to 2023, but sometimes things just happen. I mean, some people, maybe they think I could brave the elements, I can handle this, but... Turns out maybe things got underestimated, but by the time you realize that, I mean, you're in that position, what can you really do about it? Sometimes you you can't do anything. One thing that always results in deaths every winter, and it happens down in Florida and other states whenever there's a devastating hurricane, likewise is uh, the generator usage. And hopefully if you own a generator, you know this, but never, ever, ever operate the generator indoors because it it emits carbon monoxide. You can't detect it. That will 100%, without a doubt, kill you. So if you're going to use a generator, please have it outside. And I know sometimes folks, and I understand the thought process, you think, but a generator, I mean, that could cost money, and the way some people are, you have it outside, you know, and someone... You get people who can't stop stealing things, and uh, someone might take it. But there's a difference between having it outside and being able to safely use it versus having it inside and dying. Because if it's inside, you're going to be one of those folks you hear about on the news, and it happens every single year. Time and again. So that's why, not to sound like a broken record, but I will always raise awareness to this. Always, without hesitation. I know I said there was a second thing I was going to talk about. Actually, scratch that. I I changed my mind, but I'll, I'll leave that in for the heck of it. But that's really just the one thing I wanted to raise. So now... For the rest of the show, going to get into some of the stuff that I recorded a bit earlier. I apologize if any of the editing is haphazard or if I say certain things, because when I recorded these things, I thought that I was going to release the show earlier than it did. So if there's any continuity, confusion, that that should hopefully explain it. But anyway, all of the information is still pertinent still valid, so let's get into it. 
You're listening to VORW International. First things first. In the last show, I was mentioning that there were some issues with the microphone. And I talked for a while about how, and indeed this was the issue, there was a problem with the cord that connected the microphone itself to my computer. And I guess the cord was just a little faulty. Certain things, you know, just have a a shelf life of sorts. Might not be made the best, etc. But uh, because of an issue with that cord, it was causing the occasional crackling sound with the microphone, and it wasn't really a good kind of crackling either. Now, you might say, a good kind of crackling? Is there such a thing? But uh, by that, I would mean kind of like this analog sound that would make it sound like I'm on an old radio or something. That, that wouldn't be too bad. But, no, this is just more of a an annoying type of crackling sound, and I'm sure... Some of you know what I'm talking about. It would happen occasionally in each show. And it was very frustrating. And uh, even more frustrating than that was the whole process trying to get the spare uh, replacement cable. I knew exactly what it needed. I knew exactly what the cable was. Issue was that the cable I was looking for, these places were hellbent on selling it. So, mind you, the cable itself probably costs, what, realistically, $2 or so? I couldn't just pay the $2, or even if they wanted to upcharge it, the $5, $10 just for the cable. Instead, they were saying, oh, no, you need to buy it with this and this, and you need to buy it with this uh, whole kit that includes a stand and all this stuff that I already have. I don't need another one of these things. I just need the cable. But they were saying, oh, you have to pay 80 bucks to get all this other stuff with it, or else you can't get the cable. Which was very frustrating. So I wanted to hold off on that a bit, in hopes that a better deal would come along. And finally, finally, the waiting actually did pay off this time around. Because finally, it paid off. I was able to get that cable by itself. I replaced it. And the issue should be totally gone. Uh, I've been using the new cable regularly for a while now. And, uh... It hasn't given me any problems, so that's a relief. That that issue is finally solved. So that's the good news. All the other news in this show tonight, I don't know if it's all that good. So... Let's start with the bad news. What to get to first? The radio side of things, or the YouTube side of things? Well, I can't make up my mind, so let's do a... Let's do an online coin toss. Let's let... The online coin toss decide heads is going to be... I talk about the YouTube first, Tails, I talk about the radio first. All right, let's flip this online coin. I would flip a regular coin, but I don't have one nearby anyway, so. All right, here goes. Heads. So heads was about the YouTube, so let's let's talk about that first. I already mentioned this in the last review that I did, but I'll, uh, I'll elaborate slightly. All right. On December 2nd, I tried out this item from Wendy's. And may I say that it was the worst Wendy's item I've ever had. And uh, quite frankly, probably one of the worst items just in general I've ever had without exaggeration. Some people will say, oh, the title, the, the, the worst this, the best that, blah, 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 clickbait, right? But I can say, without exaggeration, I mean every single word of that title. That sandwich 
was horrid. It was absolutely ungodly bad in every conceivable way. Every way. This thing was horrible. You know, let me tell you, I don't know, very rarely do I have good experiences with these stupid Italian sandwiches in these places. And unless I'm really desperate, I don't know if I'm going to review one of these Italian sandwiches ever again. It disgusts me. It's one of those things, like I'll give an example, and I think you, you, some of you could probably relate to this. There was a time, to kind of go into a little brief anecdote, there was a time back in 2014 when I got a stomach virus, and even though this wasn't the food that caused it, because the mental association was there, it was really, it, it led to me not having a favorable view of this item for a long time, just because of the association. That ever happened to you? Where, I remember, I was sick before this, but it really, it peaked, and it just kind of lined up, where I had some hot dogs, and, uh, again, I was already sick. They weren't what made me sick, but that night the uh, illness manifested itself, and I wound up throwing up all the hot dogs that I ate. Like I said, those weren't what made me sick, but the visualization, you know, of seeing them, it just led to that connection in my mind, even if that's not what triggered the illness, seeing those hot dogs and throwing them up, it just had a very negative connotation. And for a while, it was difficult for me to eat hot dogs. I kind of avoided them for a couple years because, again, I would just keep thinking about throwing them up whenever I would see them. And so it led to, you know, unpleasant memories, unpleasant feelings, you know, and so on. And I feel like this these Italian sandwiches are similar, but the, the difference is that that is the culprit, right? Those hot dogs back in 2014, they were just a poor victim. They just, they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't hurt me any. They just happened to be the last thing I ate as the stomach virus was manifesting itself. Whereas... The Italian sandwich, that thing started it, it's responsible for it, and it caused all those problems. So, that sandwich from Wendy's is guilty as charged. <sighs> Chicken filet, mozzarella cheese, Asiago cheese, marinara sauce, on a special garlic knot bun. The, these sorts of items are usually really good or really bad, and there's very little middle ground with them. And this was no exception. You ever have one of those times where you're trying to put some salt on something? Could be anything. I know this has happened to me, especially with uh, french fries, but it goes for anything. And you're trying to sprinkle some salt on them, and you accidentally put too much salt on whatever it is you're attempting to, to season a little bit, and you have the salt overload, essentially. Once there's too much salt, there's not a lot you could do, and that saltiness overpowers everything else to the point where it's, it's very uncomfortable to eat. And oftentimes, it's inedible. 
I'm sure we've all had those experiences. That's how this thing was. It was like pure salt. I felt like I had a salt shaker and the top came off and all the salt just got dumped on this thing. Generally speaking, I don't mind salt. And uh, certain foods, I will put more salt on than, than most people would. So this item was so salty, it couldn't be enjoyed at all. All right, it tasted horrible. Now that in and of itself is usually enough to warrant a bad review when it's just disgusting and really hasn't any redeeming qualities whatsoever. As usual, I did the review. I, I got it uploaded, you know, was working on it. I got it uploaded the next day. Got it released, and everything was going smooth enough, and... Then I remember, I had this feeling... Because some people were saying, well, how, how do you know that... This item from Wendy's caused you additional problems, and I'll tell you why. You have to understand that I don't eat a ton. I think... Most of you listening could probably figure that out without me having to say that. But I don't eat a ton. You know, I eat one meal a day. But mind you, that's all that I need to sustain myself, because that's what I do. I, I sustain myself. It's just things are constant. And if I feel like I'm going to be doing more one day or, or, or what have you, I'll accommodate that. But, uh, you know, I eat a uh, satisfactory amount, again, to sustain myself and uh, keep everything going. So that, that all works out just fine. So, I knew, time-wise, this thing was uh, the, last, the last thing I ate. I hadn't eaten anything before that for a day nor did I eat anything after it for a day. And so by the time it manifested itself, there was only one thing in my system that it could have possibly been. And when you have this very suspect food to begin with, it's just you, you could obviously narrow everything down and you know exactly what it is. So that's why. I know for most people, if you're eating three meals a day, and then, you know, you eat three more meals, and you're snacking and doing this and that, it gets a little tricky, and then you could say, all right, well, maybe it could have been this, or it could have been that, etc. But in my case, I know for sure it couldn't have been. It, it was impossible for it to be anything but this, just based on what I eat and how often I eat, etc., so that answers any question, well, how do you know for sure? But because there's, no, there's nothing else it could have been. All right. So, sure enough, after I get the video uploaded, I feel this, this solid feeling. And it's like it's just sitting there in my stomach. It's not moving, it's not digesting, it's just there, it's just existing. And I knew that wasn't good. And then, you know, everything manifests itself after that. The pain, you're really tired, but you can't get comfortable, and the pain keeps getting in the way, and... And this, that, and the other thing. And I start getting physically exhausted, but it's just too much pain that I can't sleep. And then I started getting really, really cold. And this happened multiple times. And at first I thought that it's just because... I mean, I get sensitive to temperatures sometimes. That, that does happen to me. Like right now, as I'm recording this, my feet are really cold. But that's just a normal thing for me. Like I'm used to that. I'm used to my extremities being uh, a bit cold. Same thing with my hands. So I thought, okay, maybe it's just something to that extent where it's just a bit... I don't know, I'm just, maybe I'm more sensitive to the temperatures today. But no matter what I did, I could not get warm. 
nothing worked. Extra blankets, that was just freezing. I was just so, I felt so cold. I was, you know, shivering, and I thought, this isn't normal. You know, it reminded me of when I had COVID last year, and that was the last time I had felt like that, and obviously I had a fever at that point. So when I started realizing that, you know, I put two and two together, and I realized, yeah, well... This cold, this this level of being cold, does not seem natural to me. So I'm gonna take my temperature, and let's see, because this 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 doesn't feel normal. So sure enough, I did, and it came back at 102 degrees. So that's when I knew, yeah, it's uh, I'm definitely going through something right now. And that's when I realized it was mild food poisoning. So I was down for the count for a while. Had to rest. Uh, That's when I said, all right, I'm just going to go liquids only for a bit. Water, you know, some healthy drinks, some uh, Pedialyte and things like that. And uh, just try to let the thing run its course. Clean out my system. uh, Take it easy and, and then go from there. So that was my strategy, and thankfully that worked. I was down for the count for a while. It was a persistent. It was very persistent. But in the end, I was able to get over it, and uh, things are back to normal at this point. So, obviously, if you, I, I think the item is horrible, but if you get it, it's not gonna. I don't think it's gonna make you sick. There were clearly problems at the local Wendy's that uh, that are exclusive to this one. The thing that I'm glad is that I didn't eat any more of that sandwich because, I mean, I think to myself, in that review, I only took a few small bites. I mean, you saw how much of that thing that I ate on the camera, that's just, that, that's, that's what I ate. I didn't have any more of it than, again, what was witnessed in that video. Imagine if I ate that sandwich in its entirety. I think it was bad enough as it, as it was. But I just imagine it would have been a million times worse if I ate that whole thing. That's the one thing I'm glad that I didn't do. So that had me down for the count for a while. It was a, uh, it was just a very stressful week. And then, you know, when you're down for the count like that, other problems, I don't know. I've mentioned this before, but there always seems to be a a degree of, of truth to the phrase, when it rains, it pours. I always feel like these problems, they tend to follow one another. So it's like when you're down, then they all, all this, all this stuff comes into your life. And, well, it is what it is. These are just my problems, and I'm not going to sit here and, uh, and go on about this stuff all day. That's not why I'm at the microphone. But, uh, it just all, it's like the floodgates open up, right? And you have one problem, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then another, and, uh... And it gets stressful. Yeah, that's how it is. But anyway, at least this one issue got cleared up. That's good. So that's good. It's unfortunate that it had to happen, but that's behind me now. Never having that item again, and I'm never going to that Wendy's again. There's one a bit further away... And I'm I'm going to give that one a shot. Next time I have to review something, never going to this damned place, the closest one to me ever again. I just can't do it. I can't, uh... I can't take that risk. It is what it is. So then, here's the second issue that I wanted to bring up. And like I said, this materialized... Uh, while I was down for the count, and I thought, oh, just my luck, (laughs) you know. It's frustrating, but 
It was something I had to think about. It's something that I had to sit and think about. And I I made that choice. I decided I can't do it. You know, I just can't do it. Some of you may know, on the radio side of things, I do a number of broadcasts each week. And I enjoy doing them. I enjoy doing the radio show. It's a medium that is unobstructed, and I don't have to worry about algorithms controlling what, you know, you can or can't say. I know that I could just share my thoughts on whatever I want to talk about without consequence. And it's very freeing. It's very relieving. And I enjoy it. And uh, and it's just great. So I do the shortwave broadcasts to North America, and those are fine. They're going smoothly as ever. Very successful, very well received, and I'm very happy with them. Then I have the broadcast to Europe, which I started up back in, I guess it was March or April of this year, and I've been continuing on a weekly basis ever since. I mentioned, because of the energy issue, I knew that the cost of energy was going to go up. I knew that. I was told that. I, they said, be aware, on New Year, the price of energy is going up, and it's going to impact the price you pay for the radio airtime. Because the way I'm able to do this show, I don't get paid to do the radio show. I pay to do it. Which, uh, some of you might say, that's not very profitable, is it? No, it's not. I don't make a, I don't make a cent doing it. But I do it because I enjoy doing it. Even though I've lost, probably over the years, many tens of thousands of dollars uh, on this radio show. It's uh, one of those things, you know, it's just another reason to, uh, to wake up each day. You know, that's how it is sometimes. So the costs go into it. And that's one of the chief reasons why I have and maintain the Patreon page. And thankfully, because of the the support that comes in on Patreon, and even PayPal too, I'm able to pay the radio airtime bills, and by and large, you know, each month I still have to pay some some money out of pocket, Um, but I'm able to keep things afloat. I'm able to keep the, the shows head above water. That's how it's been able to continue all these years. Anyway, I knew that the airtime rate, because I buy the the radio airtime per hour, and I knew it was going to increase. And I should add, the airtime to Europe is already the most expensive of any station that I use. And they said, all right, and it's going to get more expensive, so just get ready for that. Okay, so I I did. I started preparing for it, did a little bit of fundraising, and uh, I thought, all right, I'm going to be prepared for this, you know, and I'm going to be as ready as I am. So early December comes around, and... I finally get that update as to what they're going to be raising the airtime rate to, or I should say, by what percentage they're going to be increasing it. And I was pleasantly surprised. I thought, all right, the price is going up and it's going to be more expensive, yes, but it's still something that's doable, right? It's still it's still something that I could work with. So this is good. Uh, The day is saved. Everything is going to work out for the better. So it's all going to be good, right? No problem. If only it were as simple as that. Sure enough, after getting the information, you know, I thought, okay, this, um, this should be doable. And, uh... I reached out to the the transmission provider. I said, okay, thank you for the heads up about the rate. 
I think this is something that I will be able to work with. And uh, I'd like to book some airtime for January and February of 2023. You know, I'd like to pay in advance. That way I'm able to get a little bit of a, a buffer going and uh, get my foot in the door. And, and that way I have that sense of continuity and everything's good. So I said, okay, thanks for the heads up about the, the rate increase, but I could still work with this. Uh, so let's go. Let's let's keep it going into 2023 because I've paid that broadcast through to the end of 2022. So I told him, all right, let's keep it going. Let's uh, let's 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 go. Uh, let's buy two months worth. Well, this is when it all starts going downhill because right now everything is looking good. I find out that the station is under new management. And I guess the official changeover is going to be at the end of the year, but you know, they, they kind of have that transitory period and I think the new management is already pretty much in charge and calling the shots. And what do you know, stereotypically these days, and I'm talking about 2022, what, what usually happens when management changes? What, what happens, right? Everything goes to sh- that's the honest truth. And you see it. I mean, you name a place and the management changes in this day and age. How often is it that the change is usually for the better? It happens, but it seems rarer and rarer. And I feel like there's so many places that the management changes and for some reason the new folks in charge are just adamant on driving a good thing into the ground. So, what do you know? What do you know? The trend continues. So they inform me. I let them know I'm ready to keep this going. They inform me. I found out. They didn't even, but I could tell as a different person I was dealing with. And then based on the situation, I had to start doing some research. And that's how I found out that the management actually changed. And then it, everything made sense afterward. But they told me, okay, we'll still work with you, but effective immediately, we are changing the means of payment that we are accepting. And I don't want to get overly detailed because I, I want to respect privacy. I want to respect the, the privacy of the situation, but the means of payment that they were solely accepting from now on was not something that I was comfortable with in the slightest. And based on the, the details, or lack thereof, that were provided to me, with no explanation whatsoever, nor was there any clarification, I didn't feel safe or comfortable proceeding. And it was explicitly mentioned that there was going to be no alternative than this either deal with it and use this method that you don't like or leave. And the thing that has to be understood is that it's not like we were talking about tiny little sums of money here. Quite frankly, I was just mentioning a lot of the funds that get raised to help keep this show on the air our listener donations. This is your hard-earned money we're talking about. And I did not feel comfortable in the slightest of going about the means of transaction they wanted me to. I didn't feel comfortable with it. I felt like it was taking a risk. The best part was that there was so little information put forth, and I think that even if I wanted to go this route and go ahead with it, I don't even think enough information was provided that uh, the transaction would even go through to begin with, which is the best part. But uh, I gave it some time to, to think about it. I tried to 
first ask for more details, and then and, and then the responses that were put forth, again by the the new management, I came to realize because you could just tell, you know, when you're when you're talking to someone in writing, you eventually come to realize certain people have certain writing styles. And then when that suddenly changes, you think, am I talking to the same person? And that's what I started wondering. And I did some research, and that's how I found out that uh, the management changed. And then I realized, no, I'm not, I'm not dealing with the same person. That's why everything has changed so suddenly. And uh, the attitude, likewise, I guess, toward my he- hesitancy was very abrasive. And, uh, you know, just no attempt was made to try to understand the problem. It was just, you know, why aren't you sending the money now? Why, why aren't you, why aren't you sending it? So finally, I thought, I thought to myself, I thought, I can't do this. And this sucks because this was a good station. They did a good job for crying out loud. I was willing to pay even the increased rate. But I drew the line where I did. I completely stand by it. And I can't do it. This is something that I hate to walk away from. Because at least from a technical standpoint, it was one of the best stations I worked with. In terms of the signal strength, and quality in the area I was targeting. But despite that, like I said, I just have, there's a point where I refuse uh, to proceed. And it's just something that I can't do. I take, especially finances, I take it very seriously. It's serious business. And I'm not willing to just be all carefree about it. And uh, if there's something that gives me a bad feeling, I'm not just going to go ahead with it. So, as a result, you know, I I put some thought into it. I, I tried to ask for those details. I tried to get more info. Everything suggested this just isn't going to work out. And, like I said, the responses that I was getting and the tone presented things were just starting out on a very bad foot and it was leaving a very bad taste in my mouth. So last week I had to send the email that I didn't want to send, but it needed to be done. I had to tell them, I have the show paid through Friday the 30th of December. Uh, After that point, cancel because it's not happening. So, the last broadcast to Europe on 96.70 kilohertz is going to be on Friday the 30th of December, and uh, that's going to be it. So it's over uh, after that point. And this has to be the most frustrating one yet. A lot of the time, when I reduce or discontinue broadcasts. This is the first time in the show's history, and I've been doing this show for almost eight years now, and I've used many transmission providers over the years. And this has to be the first time, because usually when I discontinue a broadcast, it's for one of two reasons. Reason one, it's too expensive, costs are prohibitive, or reason two, I am dissatisfied with either the strength, you know, the signal strength or the coverage area of the broadcast, or the amount of people that it's reaching. Right? One of those two reasons. This has to be the first time I've ever had to cancel a broadcast that isn't for those reasons. I can afford it. Not easy, but I, I, it's something that I was willing to pay for. And I was satisfied with the reach and the coverage and all of that. So it's especially frustrating. But 
it was a good thing, but I have to walk away from it. So, it is what it is. At this point in time, now that's going to free up a lot of resources for uh, the broadcast. So with those resources freed up now for 2023, I'm uh, reaching around to different transmission providers, and uh, I'm going to go from there. There's a couple stations that I'm looking at, and we'll see what their their deals are, but uh, hopefully they'll at least be a bit more understanding as far as transactions go. I don't really know why the change was made as it was, but... I guess the new management just, they have a way of doing things, and uh, maybe it's what makes sense to them, but its I just can't get on board with it. So, when there's things that I don't have a good feeling about, I'm just the type that I'll stand my ground. It's not always an easy thing to do, it's sometimes tough, but I just couldn't relent to that. No way. So I'm reaching out to different transmission providers, and uh, we'll see what happens. But for now, the broadcast to Europe is going to end on the 30th. There may be a break in uh, transmissions there while I'm trying to find a new provider. But once things get up and running with whatever station I wind up going with, because I, like I said, I have some resources freed up now, and... Uh, I want to put them to use. So once I'm able to find another station, I'll go from there and uh, update the schedules. But uh, it's a shame. It's a loss that I didn't want to uh, sustain. But at this point, it just is what it is. So those are the updates that I wanted to mention. Now... For the remainder of the broadcast, let me take a sip of... I have water and coffee next to me. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Vanilla latte. It's a French vanilla blend this time around. Yeah, it's nice. It's it's light, but it still has that little that little kick, which is good. All right, so anyway, now I'm just going to peruse around and kill whatever time I want to kill and talk about whatever I want to talk about. I'll open up the news and we'll see what there is. Go from there. You know, I don't think anyone's really going to care about this. I found it a bit amusing. All right, here's something that you need to understand about shortwave radio. Certain parts of the world have more shortwave listeners than others. And I think that makes sense. And I know I've explained this before, but the shortwave radio, it, uh, it gets listened to, you know, by a variety of people for a variety of reasons. And you have some listeners in the developing countries that listen out of necessity, where you have folks living under dictatorships that listen uh, to try to escape censorship. You have people in very rural or remote areas that listen uh, because it's all they can really get. Uh, You have people that listen because they want the alternative programming. Uh, You get people who like the technical specificities or uh, the aesthetic, you know, folks who are uh, are hobbyists, etc. There's a lot of people that listen for uh, a lot of reasons. And shortwave radio, I always give a little bit of a breakdown just so you know what it is. It's uh, the means of the radio spectrum 
from around 1700 kilohertz, so think right when the AM band ends, all the way up to 30,000 kilohertz. So it's not something that you could usually get on a car radio or anything. But what makes a shortwave radio so unique and uh, special, in my opinion, is the fact that the signals travel very, very far distances. So it's like, you know, an FM radio station, you're able to hear for maybe a couple dozen miles at most. And then the signal gets real staticky and it, and it disappears. And AM radio stations, especially at night, you might be able to hear them for uh, maybe a hundred miles, maybe more. And eventually they might fade out a bit too. But, you know, the coverage area for the AM stations, yeah, the audio quality might not be as crisp as the FM stations, but you have a much larger coverage area. So shortwave radio, audio quality-wise, it kind of, it sounds like AM radio. You know, it's just that, that uh, amplitude modulation and, uh, you know, it could be a little staticky, etc., but it's like AM radio, but the coverage area, instead of dozens of miles or hundreds of miles, is thousands of miles. And the way it works is the certain frequencies interact with the upper atmosphere in certain ways, so it's more akin to, uh, like if you have a mirror and you're shining a flashlight off of a mirror, you know, you shine the beam of light onto the glass, and then it'll bounce off the glass, and, uh, you know, the light will be reflected elsewhere. Think of it that way. You have the shortwave transmitter that'll beam the signal up into the atmosphere, and then the upper atmosphere, like a mirror, at the certain frequencies, it'll bounce the signal back to Earth, but at an angle, and uh, as a result, the signal will land thousands of miles away. So because of that, you can have a transmitter with enough power, let's say in the U.S., and at the right time and frequency, you could beam that broadcast, the signal, let's say over to the uh, African continent, and I could have the signal heard in the entire continent. I would just need that one transmitter and someone all the way on the coast, let's say in Senegal, will be able to listen to the very same station that someone all the way in Mozambique would be listening to simultaneously. So it's a way that a radio signal can reach a huge geographic area from a transmitter far away. So then when you think of places that, let's say, are very, very censored, like North Korea, then it makes sense if let's say the Voice of America wants to give, uh, you know, U.S. government news or perspective to listeners in North Korea, obviously Kim Jong-un is not going to let the U.S. set up a radio station in North Korea, but if the U.S. has a transmitter, let's say in Guam, they can beam the signal over to North Korea and uh, still broadcast there, which is exactly what U.S. stations like the Voice of America uh, do on a daily basis. So anyway, that's the advantage of shortwave, the huge geographic reach. And it makes sense then when you think of the days before the internet, why, uh, why that medium was more popular back then, because that was the way a lot of folks were able to get an international perspective of things. Its first heyday was, a. Uh, back in World War II, and then its second peak was in the Cold War, and uh, kind of dying down eh, right after the fall of the, the uh, right after the, the, let's say, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Gulf War kept it going a bit, and then as the internet rose to prominence, uh, obviously shortwave radio became less and less relevant, and uh, has been in decline ever since. But that's not to say that it doesn't have any listeners. There still are folks who still uh, listen in, you know, for all the reasons discussed. But certain areas have 
larger audiences than others. So it's not like, of all the shortwave listeners still in the world, which I believe number in the tens, if not hundreds of millions, that's not an evenly distributed number. Uh, it's highly clustered in certain areas. So, for instance, based on what I've, I've researched, I think the areas where shortwave radio is still the most popular with broad audiences are uh, areas of rural... South America, such as especially the Amazon, I know for a fact that one station operated by the government of Brazil, Brazil, Radio Nacional da Amazonia, they exclusively broadcast on the shortwave, and they're a very well-known station. They clearly have a large audience there. That's how a lot of the rural communities out there still get their news. So you still have a mass audience over there. Likewise, Cuba still has some listeners. I think it is declining over there, but there still are some listeners in Cuba. Uh, areas of Africa still have large shortwave audiences, especially some parts of Nigeria. There's still a good number of listeners scattered throughout West Africa. Of course, you think of the Sahara, the uh, remote areas there, that seems self-explanatory. The Horn of Africa is uh, where it's probably most popular still. Uh, when you think of places like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, etc., when you think of the poverty, the constant state of war, and some of the uh, regimes that are still over there, and then even neighboring Yemen, and yes, that's on the Arabian Peninsula, but it's still very close by. You think of everything going on over there, South Sudan. Yeah, it's still very, very much utilized, and there are tons of broadcasts and tons of listeners over there. But I'll ask you a question. Did you notice a region, or really just a country, that... Maybe some folks thought I would have added that I didn't mention. And that wasn't a mistake either. It's on purpose. And if you immediately thought of Ukraine, you are correct. Now you might be saying, well, why didn't you mention uh, Ukraine in terms of a country having a large shortwave radio audience, right? I mean, they're, they're going through a lot in terms of the conflict, and I saw all these news articles and everything about shortwave radio, so why didn't you mention them? I, of course they have a large audience there, don't they? I don't think so. I really do not believe so. I think that common logic... And the historical precedent would highly suggest that there should be an audience there, but I don't believe that there is. And I'll prove it, just based on what I've seen. Now, that doesn't, now here's the thing that we have to correlate. That doesn't mean that there aren't any listeners in Ukraine but I do not think that there is a massive audience. There might be thousands, there might be tens of thousands of listeners in Ukraine, but I do not believe that there are hundreds of thousands, like some thought. When I look up on Google, I think, I think it was expected that there would be a larger audience there than there really is. And like I said, everything I've seen suggests that. But we look up on Google, shortwave radio, Ukraine. What do we see? Story after story after story, anywhere from March to May of this year. CTV News, how shortwave radio is resurfacing as a tool in Ukraine. 
theconversation.com, shortwave radio in Ukraine, why revisiting old school technology makes sense. TPR.org, BBC World Service Resurrects Broadcasts, RAND.org, why the BBC World Service's new Ukrainian service is important. And uh, we continue on and on. I specifically remember this story. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Why BBC revived shortwave radio dispatches in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it just keeps going. It continues and continues. I remember on social media, there were some big posts that got a lot of attention. On Twitter, for instance, everyone's favorite platform these days. This post has 62,000 likes about the BBC setting up the shortwave. That was a big story. And this one has 35,000 likes. And this one has 6,000 likes. And, uh, you know, you could keep going on and on. You could find posts on Facebook, I'm sure, with, you know, tens of thousands of likes, and posts on Reddit with tens of thousands, and, uh, you know, this huge, huge, uh, this huge fanfare about how, especially the BBC, was, uh, resuming broadcasts to Ukraine. So, after all that coverage, it's December now, Right, so it's been a few months. It's been, uh, I mean, it's been about, how many months has it been? Uh, let's see, it started in maybe April. It's been about seven, eight months, I'd say, at this point. Where do things stand? Because obviously, with all that coverage and all that heavy publicity... Obviously, they've got an established audience now, right? And uh, and they're going stronger than ever. What if I told you that the BBC ended broadcasts to Ukraine three months ago and zero people even noticed? You might find that hard to believe because you might say, you know, that's BS. I mean... Look at it. It was front page news. It was uh, uh, shared, uh, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of times on social media. It it was on all the networks. So how could it just disappear like that and no one even noticed for three months? It did. I, I noticed it, but I don't think anyone else did. And I intentionally, because I thought to myself... Is the audience really as low as I, I think it is at this point? So I thought, I'm not going to bring any attention to this whatsoever. I thought, I'm going to wait for even just one other person to mention that these broadcasts are gone. I mean, anything. It doesn't need to be a news story. A mention, as far as I'm concerned, is even just a hobbyist wondering why they can't pick up the signal anymore. Nothing. There has not been a single word about the broadcast being discontinued for over three months straight. That proves to me, right then and there, not that there aren't any listeners. Again, there might have been some folks that were impacted by that, uh, you know, that haven't the means to say anything about it online, or there might be people that just, you know, they don't, they don't really, uh, share all their thoughts on social media or anything. So I'm sure there were people that noticed its absence. But for there to be nothing about the broadcast's ending, no one even noticing, for over three months, tells me that the amount of listeners had to have been very low. 
I bet it started out strong, but I figure the BBC, obviously, they do some audience research, and they must have realized around September when they uh, discontinued it that they they maybe were getting listenership, I don't know, maybe 5,000 listeners or so, which is all right, but when you're talking about huge amounts of money going into it, it just doesn't really justify the expenditure. So I would wager that they came to the conclusion that there isn't much of an audience, and obviously their bet paid off, because no one noticed it. So I think that it got so much coverage going in, because well, also shortwave radio and broadcasting is a, a phenomenon that not a lot of people fully understand, and it's one of those things that you could just... People will just accept whatever you tell them about it, really. That's, uh, that's the truth. So I think a lot of people are also going off of assumptions, uh, maybe that we're a bit dated. You know, you think of Ukraine, and you, you can't help but think of... And you think of Russia and all that, you can't help but think of the Cold War. And uh, with that, of course, you think of Cold War-era technology. But uh, I think people in Ukraine... Uh, they just get their news from other means. They, they just don't really listen to shortwave radio. I think people there listen to the radio, but I think more people there listen to uh, FM and AM radio than they do shortwave. And uh, I believe there's a lot of truth to that because a lot of effort has been uh, put forth to restoring some of the AM transmitters both in Ukraine and Russia and some of the neighboring countries. So that tells me that's where the audience is. And shortwave broadcasting, uh, people don't want to admit it, but I think it's just a thing of the past, at least in Ukraine. Because it would be one thing if the BBC discontinued that broadcast and then there was just as much fanfare about its discontinuation as there was its creation. That would be one thing. That would suggest that there's an audience that noticed it and is upset and impacted by that decision. But when no one even noticed, then that tells me that there was practically no one to notice. And it would be one thing if people didn't notice for a couple days or even weeks, but months. That's very telling. And likewise, other stations uh, that broadcast to Ukraine, the results are very similar. NHK Radio Japan and uh, Radio Austria International all discontinued their broadcasts to Ukraine. Two independent stations to Ukraine uh, eventually left the airwaves as well. Deutsche Welle and Radio France International had plans originally to uh, broadcast on shortwave to Ukraine, and uh, both of them threw in the towel before they even... that never even made it to reality. The, the ideas got sidelined. All of that anecdotal evidence suggests to me that there just isn't much of an audience in Ukraine at this point. If they all left, they all had to have left for a reason. And I think it's the same reason. Probably cost-related, but likewise, the results just do not meet the, uh, the costs as well. There just isn't much of an audience there. Now... I will further back this up with my own direct observations, because mind you, yeah, the broadcast, look at what I'm doing. But, you know, the reason I'm discontinuing that broadcast isn't because of audience or any of that. It's, I already went through that. Uh, but anyway, my broadcast on 96.70 kilohertz went right over Kiev. It went across the entirety of Ukraine and uh, then into Russia. How much response did I get from Ukraine? 
some. I got some. But it wasn't the vast majority of correspondence. So if I were broadcasting only to Ukraine, I would say, yeah, the results are disappointing. However, that's not the goal of my broadcast. So you might think that's pretty negative. I mean, you know, a lot of people really were, were thinking and hoping that uh, this was going to, you know, provide some sort of resurgence. But it's clear that it's only proven uh, that there's no listeners. That's my interpretation of it in Ukraine. So some may consider that disappointing. Disappointing it may be, but that's just the fact of the matter. There is, however, a silver lining. You noticed I haven't mentioned Russia. There are listeners in Russia. And that's the thing that a lot of broadcasters missed the mark on completely. Everyone went all out to try to target the Ukrainian audience that they thought was there, that really wasn't, and completely ignored or forgot about the Russian audience that actually exists. Compared to Ukraine, the amount of feedback I've received from Russia is tremendous. And without a doubt, there is an abundance of listeners in Russia. Again, still nowhere near as many as, uh, you know, what you might have in uh, some other parts of the world. But there are definitely way more radio listeners in Russia than there are Ukraine. I can prove that firsthand based on the fact that I've broadcast with the same power and equipment that all of these other broadcasts that I'm making comparisons to have the very same stuff. And that signal was received with equal strength in both Ukraine and Russia. And the amount of feedback from listeners in Russia uh, was very, very large. There are still listeners over there without a shadow of a doubt, I could say. And interestingly, despite the stations that came on the air earlier in the year explicitly targeting Ukraine uh, that are, you know, either gone or are struggling, the stations that targeted Russia, all of them are pretty much still going. There is an independent station that started up targeting Russia, they're still on the air. They didn't leave. Because I'm sure they're getting the listener response to justify it. Vatican Radio, their transmissions to Russia, still going. NHK, their transmissions to Russia, still on the air. They dropped the ones to Ukraine, but to Russia, those are still going. Remember that initiative that I talked about earlier in the year, that, uh, you've been a long-time listener, you remember it, uh, that would rebroadcast the Radio Free Europe programming, they hit the nail on the head. And I knew they would, because they had a good team. That's why I advocated them strongly. Because I knew that they knew what they were doing. They are still going. And they are still relaying, I believe, I think it's three to four hours every day, Radio Free Europe programming in Russian to Russia because that's where the listeners are. I'm sure that's where the response comes from. They realize that early on and that's why they're still going. So the broadcasters that realized that this potential audience isn't in Ukraine where we thought you know, by common logic, you'd think that's where they'd be. Turns out they actually aren't there. But they're in Russia instead. And uh, shifting the focus to Russia, 
There's listeners, continuity, etc. So that was an interesting revelation. And sure enough, I remember at one point one broadcaster to Russia uh, did leave the airwaves. They eventually returned, which is another huge sign. But that broadcaster left the airwaves. And I saw comments online and on social media from listeners in Russia wondering what happened to it. So if you're trying to, to tell me that somehow this broadcaster that most people had never heard of, and they left the air, and they were getting responses. Yet the BBC left the air despite this huge media frenzy when they started broadcasts, and didn't get a single response in three months. To me, that tells me everything I need to know again about where the listeners are and where they aren't. As far as shortwave broadcasting goes, I would say Ukraine is a lost cause. I wouldn't even bother if anyone listening, I know it's unlikely, but if anyone listening even has the slightest inclination of, of broadcasting anything on the shortwave, don't even waste the time or the money to broadcast to Ukraine because you're not really going to have anyone listening. And if you want to target an audience in that part of the world, just go with Russia instead. And, uh, you know, direct the programming there. That's my opinion, anyway. And that's just what everything suggests to me, and that's what my own results back up. It's not like I'm seeing one thing, but then everything in my case contradicts it. Right? It's... this is how it is. I thought that was interesting... And like I said, because it's one of those things that there was so much coverage over at first. And uh, it's funny, every now and then I still see some article get published about how uh, the BBC started the broadcasts, not realizing they've been gone for months now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, like I said, I think everyone thought there would be listeners there, and it just turned out that the media habits have changed. Some places they change, some places they, they really don't. Russia, Ukraine is a good comparison. But I'll also say, based on what I've seen, when shortwave broadcasts with a sizable audience leave the airwaves, they are newsworthy events. When the BBC left the airwaves in 2001, uh, when they broadcast to the United States and really North America, they had an estimated listenership at a minimum on the shortwave of 300,000, and uh, many analysts at the time put it more toward a million. Those are a lot of people. And sure enough, when they stopped the broadcasts, it did make the news. Because that shows this, there was a real audience and the impact really was felt. Even if you go years later to 2017, when Radio Australia left the airwaves, the same type of situation. There was a huge amount of coverage because there was an actual large audience that was getting the short end of the stick and was being impacted. This, on the other hand, no one even noticed, so how is it even newsworthy? Just something interesting, that's my... that's my hot take. Let's check the news. You know, I was seeing... more and more pushback... against... AI-generated art. And I hope, for those who may be upset by it, I just hope it, th this whole thing provided a little bit of perspective. Here's what I mean. I know that some of the same... My stance in terms of automation, I've always had problems with it when it's done to excess. And to the point where sometimes the consequences are just 
are greater than the benefits, right? The drawbacks outweigh the benefits. And uh, I've always had that concern. But, you know, I would mention that even back, I remember in 2018, I got so much flack for saying this that I mentioned my at least opposition or concern when in the future long distance trucking becomes automated and all the truck drivers get essentially screwed over and uh, and lose their jobs and pretty much the I remember the response at the time was unanimous against what I was saying and was in total defense of automation. Now, yeah, being an artist and being a a long-haul truck driver, indeed, those are two very different things. But when we break down the root of the problem and, you know, the concerns that I had at the time, really, it's not too different an issue. I mean, look at it this way, right? My concern stemmed from people whose livelihood was either threatened, challenged, or completely ended by automation and artificial intelligence. That was my problem. And you could really put this to to many different fields. Like I said, now there are those instances where the automation and all of it, yeah, the benefits outweigh the drawbacks, but there are those cases where I fear anyway, the drawbacks outweigh the benefits. And my biggest concern was uh, not so much about the automated trucks themselves. I mean, I still, I hate that concept. What if, how can someone, I could just see that being a nightmare right there, but so I have a problem with that, but an even bigger problem, the impact it would have on millions and millions of uh, individuals, again, just making life uh, just much more difficult for them and uh, and uh, really just throwing a huge, huge wrench, I suppose, into their livelihood. A lot of the concerns about AI-generated art. Really, when you break it down, a lot of the concerns are exactly the same. It's about these folks who try to do art and they work hard on it. Some of them try to do it for a living. Now, all of a sudden, AI-generated art, what is it doing? It's either competing, it's challenging, or it's outright ending the uh, livelihoods for some of these folks. So while the set of circumstances is slightly different, as far as I'm concerned, at least the the root of the problem, the thing that I think concerns the most people, is uh, is exactly the same. But, you know, it's not a big deal. I, I mean, I think all the people who sell art and, you know, are trying to be artists and uh, maybe their livelihoods are being threatened by the uh, AI-generated art, don't they realize that there still needs to be people that are going to oversee the AI? So why why don't they just go and get a job doing that, right? I mean, who cares? This is... if there, There's going to need to be people to o- oversee and watch the AI and uh, monitor it, so just just do that instead, right? Now do you realize how stupid that sounds? <laughs> I know, I'm probably being bitter, but uh, I can't help it. I, yeah, I am being bitter and, uh, and very sarcastic. I hate what, I, I hate what I'm uh, seeing with the AI-generated art. These are folks that put... Uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort and a, a lot of hard work into what they do only to uh, have their work essentially ignored or devalued 
by an AI that just does it in seconds. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an insult to anyone, you know, trying to to be an artist. And uh, I understand the hostility. I certainly have a, a hostile reaction toward it. Of course, I'm going to stand in opposition to that. I think the AI generated art can be interesting, but when it encroaches and uh, and causes the problems that it does, of course, I'm going to stick with my principles. I, I feel no different about this than I do with, let's say, the automation of the uh, trucking industry. I stand again, you know, with opposition to, with both of those things when it comes down to the individual impacts. Of course, I disagree with that. I just kind of, I, I couldn't help but be a bit sarcastic when uh, the, just the reaction was so different even a couple years ago. And that's what everyone said too, but they're still going to need people to oversee it. And how many people do you think that's going to be? <laughs> right. How, how many people oversee the AI programs? For Of course, there's a couple people that do. But I think you see how ridiculous to say how ridiculous and tone deaf to say such a thing would uh, would seem. Be like, are you, you out of your mind? I just hope that this is, you know, what people we're dealing with. I hate that they are, but I hope, if anything, it's perhaps an eye-opening experience and people just maybe become a little more wary of automation don't need to reject it completely and, you know, artificial intelligence, it could still be a useful force and, uh, and it could uh, definitely help things, but it just needs to be, if it isn't reined in, you're seeing the consequences and this is just the beginning. But I fear the way people are, we're just going to get caught in one of those situations where no one really says or does anything till they actually get impacted. And by then, it's going to be far too late. That's my interpretation, anyway. That's just the way I see it heading. Doesn't mean that that's a guarantee, but that's just, you know, what the writing on the wall tells me if I were to try to read it. When I feature fan art on this program, of course, I try to the best of my ability to feature, or prioritize anyway, the fan art that someone actually spent time on. But, you know, in the end, it's going to get to a point where you, it's impossible to tell the difference. And what's to stop someone from just uh, lying and, you know, take 10 seconds to uh, generate the image and then just tell me that they spent, you know, a week making it or something, right? What's to stop that? Nothing. It's probably happened already. But this is my... my two cents. And this comes straight from... the WHO... director's mouth. Who said... China's COVID spike not due to lifting of restrictions. He said COVID infections were exploding in China well before the government's decision to abandon its strict zero COVID policy. I always, you know, I can't help it. The hell with it if they take it down for this or not. I don't care anymore. It always makes me laugh whenever I see the coverage of this, especially in China. The media coverage, it just flip-flops. Whatever way the wind blows, it's just what it does. Early on, when they were welding people in their apartments and stuff, and the videos are there, probably isolated incidents, but it happened occasionally, but uh, you saw the extremely strict measures, and first they were praised, and then they, were, they said, we all need to be like China. Then they kind of ignored China for a bit. Then everything suddenly changed about a month and a half ago to uh, China's gone too far with the the restrictions, and everyone out there on the streets is brave for protesting them. 
and um, we support the protesters and we support the folks doing that. Then the minute China relaxes them, all these stories from the, the very same outlets come out. They're making a drastic mistake. This is going to be dire for China. This is, so I think to myself, what is it then? Do you want them to, to do the zero COVID or do you not? Like I said, I, I expect nothing but the best. But uh, it just it makes me laugh. Like I said, I expect this, but <laughs> it's just too good. It's just too good. But it's not, you know, it, this isn't just a COVID thing, nor is it a China thing. It's been like this always. It's any way the wind blows, this is just what they do for anything. You know, one thing that's good a couple months ago is bad now, and vice versa. Whatever they think gets the clicks and the money, that's all that it's about. That's it. This stuff's always interesting. I always look... I remember there's a, an article about this, I think, about the last meal that you could get if you're, if you're on death row. And uh, I think the laws are different from one state to the next. Obviously, only a couple states still do this, but... Some of them allow the inmate before... Uh, they're executed, they allow the inmate to uh, request a meal. That looks like this guy in Mississippi did. He got executed today. You know, bad person did bad things. But his last meal, he said, was two bone-in fried pork chops, fried okra, baked sweet potato with butter, Pillsbury biscuits with butter and molasses, peach cobbler with French vanilla ice cream, and Lipton sweet tea. So, some states allow folks, you know, within reason to, uh, have a last meal with their choice. And other times, I think some states, might be Texas that I'm thinking of, doesn't anymore. I know there was one instance where there was some guy, and like I said, I think it was Texas, where some guy ordered a ton of food and then didn't eat any of it. Yeah, this was the one. This was the, Yeah, this was it. It was just this absolutely absurd, and I think it gets to a point where, you know, it has to be within reason. Like, it, it's... It's, um... It's got to be within reason. Like I said, I don't even... It's just a tradition. When you sometimes see these people, you think, why should they even be catered to with a last meal? Why should they get all this... Why should they get all this food for what they, for what they did? Last meal or not, you know? Do they, is that something that they deserve? Do they deserve that feast? Yeah, it's, some of them I wouldn't necessarily say so, but, you know, it's, I think it's a tradition. And, uh, yeah, this is the one I was thinking of. There was one back in 2011. This guy... All right, this is what he, this is what he asked for. He said he wanted two chicken fried steaks smothered in gravy a triple meat bacon cheeseburger with fixings on the side, a cheese omelet with ground beef, tomatoes, onions, bell peppers, and jalapenos, a large bowl of fried okra with ketchup, one pound of barbecue with half a loaf of white bread, three fajitas with fixings, a meat lover's pizza, three root beers, a pint of vanilla ice cream, and a slab of peanut butter fudge with crushed peanuts. That request was granted. So all that food, they, they went out and they either made or got for him. 
but he refused it when it arrived, saying he was not hungry. And uh, after that, Texas uh, stopped granting, I think, the requests for some of the inmates. I don't know, you know, because some of these people, they're not right in the head to do what they did in the first place. But who knows if it was just his perception of reality. I mean, more likely than not, he was probably doing it as an F.U. to the, <laughs> to the system. And said, well, oh, you know, F.U., you. I'm going to order all this food and then I'm not going to eat it. And what are you going to do about it? But uh, <laughs> I guess it's kind of morbid to say this, but it's, you know, an example of one guy ruining it for everyone else. For, for all the other well-behaved death row inmates. But that's the one I was thinking of. But some states still do. And then I think if... In the states that allow you to choose, if you decline... I think there's just some sort of pre-selected, you know, default meal that they'll give you. Might just be like the regular meal. But I remember that one. And then I think there was there was one guy. This is the one where uh, he got the meal. He wanted lobster tails and some other stuff, but he he requested to watch the Lord of the Rings film trilogy while he ate the meal. <laughs> it's a good way to try to buy yourself some time right there. Excellent films, you know, but... Especially if you went with the extended, you know, or the director's cut, or whatever it was called. You'll kind of buy yourself some, some extra hours doing that. But I don't think these requests, you know, I, I don't think they're legally binding or anything, so it could get to a point where they could say, all right, this is ridiculous, you know, you're not... You know, you're not immune from getting uh, executed just because Lord of the Rings is on. It's not like there's anything to it. Or they'll take him away, and, and all of a sudden the Supreme Court is going to issue an immediate stay... Because, you know, he didn't finish watching his movie. I, I just, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's an honored agreement like that. It's just more of a, more of a glorified, I think, gentleman's agreement just based on tradition. And that's all there really is to it. Finishing the broadcast, how about I open up the email real quick and, uh, Let's just get to a, a small handful of eh, just some emails at random, just for the fun of it. For a little variety, perhaps. V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com if you would like to uh, send in any comments, questions, pieces of feedback, etc. Let's just take a quick look. Let's see what there is. Sean is checking in. Sean in Wisconsin. I was wondering if you are a fan of A24 films or not. I really enjoyed The Green Knight and thought that Hereditary was genuinely terrifying. Recently, I was looking through their online store and saw that they had a series of zines on the internet. One of these was guest edited by Bo Burnham and he used your photo for the cover. And it looks like you were written about within the zine. Were you aware of this? Seems like a cool piece of media and supportive of your work. Would love to hear your thoughts on this. I don't know if you knew about this, just had to tell you. Uh, so thank you, Sean, in Wisconsin. I've seen a few films from A24, but I don't think I've seen enough that I could, you know, definitively give my... Uh, my formal impression, one way or the other. Uh, but I will say, commenting about the zine in question, uh, indeed, I'm aware of it, and, and I actually, they reached out to me, and I was the one that provided the photo that they used on the cover, because they reached out to me and they asked... Uh, they explained what they were interested in doing. I signed off on it. I said, all right, yeah, go for it. 
And then they asked if there were any pictures of me that they could feature. So I told them, oh, what the heck here? Use these if you want. I gave them like five different pictures. Most of them were, you know, various stills from uh, videos, but a few were uh, other images. And uh, I said, yeah, do do what you wish. You have my uh, my permission, so go for it. And that was the... Uh, that was the outcome. I was surprised. I didn't think that they were going to feature my picture on the cover of all things. I didn't know that. They said they were just going to uh, maybe include like a little excerpt or something. I thought it was, wasn't going to be anything, so I was shocked when I found out that there was my picture right on the front of it. Thank you, Sean. Just a short email coming in from Macarena, who says, uh, listening to the podcast, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your kind words. This is just an excerpt. Chinese street food blogger Gan Suzhong, probably butchered the name, but also known as Fatty Goes to Africa. To interject, I'd have to assume that that's the name that, uh, eh, that's the name he gave himself. I guess that's what he... I I don't know. It doesn't seem like the most flattering name, if you ask me. But it is what it is. That was his choice. That's the name he wanted to go with. So that's how he was known online. And uh, I suppose that's really... It's irrelevant information. It's that he was stabbed to death in Nepal while live streaming, allegedly by 37-year-old rival influencer Feng Zhengyun... The video of the incident shows him walking and laughing with two companions when he was suddenly attacked. 29-year-old was taken to the hospital where he passed away due to injuries. So thank you for sharing that. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's really no surprise when you factor in how seriously some people take social media these days. And, uh... You know, you have these rivalries, and then they... It seems like something innocent at first, that it might just be something... Online, your online banter, but the next thing before you know it... Maybe the folks just aren't the sa- on the same page, or you don't know how some people are perceiving the situation. And things escalate, and then it gets crazy like this, uh, as you saw there, and someone's dead. Wow. How old did he say he was? 29. Stabbed to death. Isn't that something? That happens, though. You know, there was one guy back in... Uh, was it, it... No, it was 2021. There was this guy that I watched in 2020 and uh, 2021... I forget his name, but, you know, he occasionally did some live streams, and he was in San Francisco, and he wasn't very well known at all, and he was he was a bit out there, you know? He had his views and opinions, and he's one of those people that's uh, loud about it, which, uh, I mean, you see that a lot in this day and age, but uh, some of his, his thoughts, anyway agreeable or not were at the very least interesting and uh, and entertaining as well. And nonetheless, I think he did bring up some legitimate issues as well. You know, he, he called out some problems as he saw them, and, uh, and they're legitimate problems, and nothing still has been done about them. But sometimes when you're very loud about things, you, I think if you're going to do that, you have to understand that you're making yourself a target. Now, if you accept that risk, and ideally you have ways to combat that risk, or you're prepared, or you have, you know, vari- whatever it might be, still, it's, you know, you're putting yourself at risk. But if you're going to go out and you're going to make a big, you know, a big deal out of things, and you're going to just be loud and etc., like I said, there's just going to be that potential for things to happen. And indeed, he had gone for 
he would also do this stuff at night. He'd walk around the city in the middle of the night. And uh, for a while, everything was fine and was left alone. But sure enough, one night, he's out doing his thing. Everything seems normal. But uh, these two guys decided, I guess, that uh, they had heard enough. And instead of just ignoring him, they pulled out knives and stabbed him. He didn't die, but he did suffer some nasty injuries. And I think the two guys that did the stabbing just you know, got like a little slap on the wrist and were on their merry way. But it goes to show these sorts of situations, like, you know, one minute the guy's just walking, doing his thing, the next thing you know, these two guys are going at him with their knives these attacks, it's not like it could always be some drawn-out standoff like you see in a movie. It happens it happens so quick. That's why when I go out, I'm always on my, my toes. And that's always why I really keep my distance from folks. I don't care how strange it looks, but it also gives you a little bit of an advantage because uh, sometimes seconds like that can really matter. And it can be the difference... You have that second, that extra second or two, you could draw whatever it is you have to defend yourself, and that could change everything. That could save you from serious injury, death, could be enough to dissuade the attacker, whatever it might be, that that time uh, can make all the difference. Little things like that can really, I mean, really help, but sometimes you... You can try to do everything right, everything by the book, and it still doesn't matter. It's all just, uh, so variable. Josh is checking in. What are your thoughts on conspiracy theories surrounding the murals and uh, construction slash design of the Denver airport? So thank you, Josh. All right, so the Denver Airport is one of those uh, structures that definitely has a lot of theories about it because there's some, you know, various discrepancies with it. It's absolutely massive. There's these uh, bizarre murals throughout the uh, airport, etc. Some people say that these murals are signs kind of pointing to various hidden functions to the airport and perhaps... Uh, some ulterior motives behind some of the the activities, or perhaps I should say some of the malevolent actions that go on there. Now, here's my interpretation. I don't know... The way I would see it, anyway, I do believe 100%, because it just makes sense, that of course there are secret facilities out there. You'd have to be out of your mind not to think that there, uh, that there aren't. Of course, it's when you factor in any major government or any just major, any government, of course there's going to be the things that you see at the surface level, and then there's going to be uh, other things going on as well, right? That's just common sense stuff. Anyone who thinks that all these governments, and even you could lump in big corporations with that too, because some of them are just as powerful as some governments, that they're open and honest and transparent about every single thing. I, I don't know what to tell you. I just don't believe that for a second, and I, there's, there's no way I could. It just doesn't make any sense to me to, to think that, but, you know, some folks do. It is what it is, whatever floats their boat. What is it to me? Uh, but nonetheless, so of course it makes sense, and there are, I'm certain, various hidden facilities for various purposes. I wouldn't be shocked, at the, at the very least, if there are various underground facilities as well, uh, or if there are various facilities built into, uh, let's say, mountains, etc. Kind of like that one west of uh, D.C., right? What is that one called? Mount Weather, I'm pretty sure? And I think that there are other facilities just like that as well. Uh, but it makes sense, of course, that these sorts of underground facilities exist, you name it. But to have something 
in a place like Denver Airport, maybe. You know, hiding in plain sight, right? That's possible. But I don't know. It just seems like if they want it to be so secretive, you know, this is a big country. There's a lot of land. There's a lot of places uh, such an installation could be constructed. I just don't know if it would be the smartest thing to make something right there at Denver Airport. But what I will say is I do think that, that some things uh, certainly occur. And I think that there's some symbolic value to certain things anyway that sometimes I feel like some people, they just treat current events or whatever just like a joke. And, and they do things just to poke fun at people and, uh, and they kind of get off on it. That's what I think anyway, because I see some things and it's just like, you know, you, you see it and you think they got to be, they're, they're doing this just to F with everyone because they know they can. I don't know if the Denver airport is something like that, but I could just see some people having a sense of humor thinking, we're going to put it right here and uh, we're going to put it right under their noses the whole time. And then we're just going to manipulate it in such a way that the whole population is going to gaslight the folks who think that there's something here. And they're all going to be telling the people who actually uh, know the truth that they're crazy and, and we're going to love every minute of it. I think some things like that really do happen. and uh, But it all comes down to your attitude. You know, it's just I'm under the belief that you have people in high positions that aren't necessarily good people. So it just makes sense to me that some of those people would then mess around with people's um, minds and do all this sort of stuff all the time. They, they love doing this, like I said. That's just my interpretation. But, you know, the Denver airport, the way I've always seen it, to me, I think it's just an airport. But who knows? Maybe there's more to it. But from my understanding, it's I think it's just an airport. Maybe there's something to the murals, so it could be just a uh, artistic preference. Could be, again, we're just going to flat out show this, and uh, then people are just going to bicker amongst themselves, and uh, I'm going to be laughing at them the entire time. I don't know. I think things like that do exist, but I don't know if the Denver airport is one of those places. I have not, I'll say this, I have not gotten any sort of overwhelmingly strong feeling like there is anything sinister to the Denver airport specifically. But that's just me. It just doesn't seem like one of those places. Some miscellaneous thoughts. That's all that I have for you in today's show. Thank you for listening. Until next time, this is VORW.